Those who pray to mind that have come across in conferences internationally, I remember in Rambo, listening to about deleted uranium and the, the long term effects of radiation. So that's Professor Chris Busby, who's going to be our first speaker. Now, absorbed dose, so when they say your dose was 
so many many secrets. That's that's absorbed those effectively. And and it's 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 a physics it's basically a physics based idea of energy per unit mass. So in other words, they measure the amount of energy that's transferred to your body from the radiation and and then they divide it into your mass. And so many joules per kilogram gives you your absorbed dose. Now there are various kinds of radiation. There's there's photon radiation like light. And there's particular particle radiation like beta particles and alpha particles. But actually, the effects of radiation all are transferred to the body in terms of charged particle tracks. So even if you are irradiated from, from outside by a gamma ray or an X-ray, um, what happens is that the, those X-rays or gamma rays are absorbed and they produce photoelectrons, or they produce electrons of some sort. And these electrons are, are like very like little bullets you can imagine flying through the tissue. And as they fly through the tissue, they create ionization. So they create like little sparks, you can think of it as little sparks, but these little sparks can attack tissue. Uh, and if the tissue that they attack is the DNA, then they can cause fixed mutations. And many of these mutations are, are, not, are, are repaired, but they can cause fixed mutations. And these fixed mutations can lead to the death of the cell, or they can lead to more serious effects. And certainly in germ cells, in, in the egg and in the sperm, they can lead to congenital, congenital malformations or miscarriages or, or, or heritable effects of some sort. So, so you have to therefore, yes, uh, so, so the, the health effects are then, uh, according to the ICRP, couched in terms of cancer. So in other words, they take a certain amount of absorbed dose and they say this amount of absorbed dose produces this amount of cancer. And this is effectively what's called a risk model. So when they're trying to work out how much radiation you can stand or what sort of dose limits there should be, they use this risk model and it says that you can't have a certain amount more than a certain dose. Now this, this risk model is entirely defined in terms of external radiation. It's defined in terms of radiation that comes from the outside, photon radiation, radiation which is from gamma rays or x-rays. And the problem is that most of the serious damage is not caused by those sorts of radiation, it's caused by internal radiation, by substances which were produced with the fissioning of uranium in 1945 and then in 1952 and then between 1959 and 1963 with the weapons fallout and then later on with uh, a whole series of, of uh, accidents and releases from nuclear power stations culminating in Chernobyl which produced an enormous amount of this material and it spread all over the planet. So all of the food that you eat now contains these, these radionuclides and when they go inside you, they can cause damage which is not easily defined in terms of its absorbed dose. And the reason for this is that, it's, is that the, the energy density, if you like, the, the, the number of little tracks of bullets that there are, varies with the kind of material that you, that you ingest or inhale. I mean, I'll give you an example. One example, a good example is the hot particle. Now, after Fukushima, my colleague and I, we looked inside car air filters, vehicle air filters. Now, vehicles breathe air. So you can take the filter out of the car and you can pull out the material inside the filter and you can put a photographic plate on top of it. And you can then look to see what, 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 what is on this photographic plate. And what you find is that the radiation is concentrated in little, little splodges, like little, little, little dots. So these dots represent the existence of little particles of material which are extremely radioactive. Now, if you inhale one of these particles of, of radioactive material, as of course the Japanese are doing all the time, it will go into your lungs and then it will be transplicated into your lymphatic system and go somewhere in your body where it will, it will cause an enormous amount of energy to, to, to be produced at one point in your body, but there will be no energy anywhere else. So to use the ICRP risk model would be false under such situation. What, you, what you're doing is you're diluting that energy into the whole body. So many joules per kilogram, but because you've diluted it into the body, the doses are very small. So the ICRP model that's being used in Fukushima at the moment is couched entirely in terms of external radiation. So what they say is that if your dose is less than a certain amount, so many millisieverts, you are okay. But actually, we know from Chernobyl that you are not okay. The, 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 the effects of the Chernobyl accident in, those, in the territories where these materials were distributed, and in fact even as far as Wales where I live, uh, gave significant increases in, in ill health, not just cancer incidentally, but a whole range of illnesses. So the first thing is that the ICRP risk model is incorrect because it doesn't distinguish properly between external and internal radiation. 
And a good way to look at this is to imagine sitting in front of a fire and warming yourself and considering the number of joules per kilogram that you get which will make you comfortably warm. And comparing that with the same number of joules per kilogram that you would get if you reach into the fire, take out a hot coal and eat it. And you can see that this, this would be the same dose under the ICRP risk model. Now in 1998, with the assistance of the Green parties in, in, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, I, I helped to set up a new group called the European Committee on Radiation Risk, the ECRR, and this is an alternative committee to the ICRP. It has about 40 eminent scientists from many countries in Europe, many of them from the ex-Soviet Union territories, uh, and we have produced our own report, which uh, there are copies of this available at the back if anybody wants to buy this, but the latest one was in 2010. And this report accurately um, accurately predicts the levels of cancer and ill health as a result of uh, accidents or, or exposures. And in fact, you might want to know so that, that in terms of Fukushima, we have used this to analyze the effects of the Fukushima uh, contamination in the 400 kilometer, no, in the 200 kilometer radius of, of, of the accident center. And it's easy to predict using a number of different methods that there will be about 400,000 cancers produced as a result of the Fukushima accident. And that's a, that's a low level, that's a minimum number. It's probably going to be worse than that. We haven't brought in Tokyo because we now know that of course it's spread much further than that. So we're talking about very, very serious matter. But as I will show you later on, as I continue, um, in fact, you don't need to know the Fukushima accident in order to have people die. Because we have measured, we have looked at, the, at people living close to nuclear power stations in this country. And it's quite easy to show using standard statistical methods and using the data that's available from the Office of National Statistics that there is a statistically significant increase in adult cancers downwind of nuclear sites in this country. Inkley Point in Somerset, Bradwell in Essex, Dreisvenet in Wales, and various other sites that we've looked at. And, and, and in fact, I've, I've recently looked at Wilga for the Welsh television, and we've found the same effect there. So in fact, it's very easy to find. So what happens in this area is we don't have science anymore. The area of the consideration of the development of nuclear is no longer a scientific matter. When I came along in the 90s and started, it, and started this lark, and I sometimes wish I hadn't, um, it was all about how the anti-nuclear movement were people who didn't understand science. You know? And the scientists used to get trotted out in their white coats and, and then later on in their hard hats or whatever uniform they were using to tell us about how we didn't really understand science. But actually this is all turned on its head now. The science is on our side. And what they do now is they just attack, attack us. I've been, I've been personally attacked in, in, on, the, on the internet. You know, my, my funders have been written to, my universities have been written to, the journals that I publish have been written to. But, and when I go into court, which I do a lot, I've probably won about 20 cases on this issue now. And the Ministry of Defence, very often I'm up against the Ministry of Defence, they send their people in there. And what they always do is they never address the science. They, they always attack me. So, oh, you know, buzz me, well, no, not case, and all the rest of it. But there's no, if you can't get away with that in a court, in a proper court, the judge will look at the evidence. The jury will look at the evidence. So you can do that out here. You can do that on the internet. But in a legal court case, you don't get away with it. So, so having established, or I hope established in your mind in the short time available, that there is a problem with the risk models, and that the main problem arises as a result of the, the misanalysis of the effects of external and internal radiation because of this problem of anisotropy. Another example of anisotropy, for example, is substances which bind to DNA. Now, it's well known chemically that there are a number of chemical elements which bind to DNA. DNA, the backbone of DNA is stabilized by calcium. 